So thanks everyone for coming to our second annual grad school panel. Um, we did one last February with the honors program, and so thanks Kelly, you've helped me kind of coordinating this and getting all the folks to come and speak to you. Um, so I'm Katie Kennedy. I work in career services. I know quite a few of you. Thanks again for coming out. Um, but the reason that we're doing this is because in the past couple of years, we've noticed that more and more students are interested in pursuing graduate study, and we've actually had many more students going on to pursue their master's degrees and PhDs. So this is kind of a timely thing, and we also want you to hear from the experts who've been through it. Um, can you hear me okay? Okay, um, and so you're hearing from folks who've been through it, who advise students on the grad school process, and so this is the best possible group of people to be hearing from. Um, so before introducing the panelists, I want to thank RJ Thayer for his help in coordinating this technical feat, and Ed um, from IT for your help as well, because we couldn't make this possible without them. Um, you also each have a packet with the panelists' bio, so if you want to know more about them, you can ask them some questions. Um, and there's some information in there that career services uh, we put together about the grad school application process, how to search for programs, that kind of thing. Okay. So that's for you to keep. That's also on the website, and I'm going to put it in the chat for our online students as well. Um, there's a bag lunch dinner for those who are here. Online students, I'm sorry. When you're coming to campus, we'll make sure we get you some, some lunch. Um, and uh, everybody who's here signed in. Um, so let's start things off by having our panelists introduce themselves and having them tell us a little bit about what inspired their decision to pursue graduate study. OK? So first, I believe, is Kathleen Phillips. Hi, everybody. My name is Kathleen Phillips. I am currently working with SUNY Canton in both academic advising and the career services in the Ready Center. I am also currently a graduate student at SUNY Brockport, and I am studying higher education administration. And on top of that, I am interning to complete my program with St. Lawrence University as well. So I'm um, still a graduate student and working for SUNY Canton. I chose to pursue my graduate degree when I realized that my undergraduate degree was a little too broad and I really wanted to narrow my focus and also find a niche in the somewhere in the realm of education and higher education called to me pretty strongly. So here I am and uh, again, thanks for being here. Thanks, Kathleen. OK, um, Kambiz, you're up. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Not, not really. No. Um, where am I? Can you? No. Sorry. OK, that's OK. Let's see here. I'm going to try now. OK. Can you hear me now? Better? OK. Good. <laughs> OK, thanks, RJ. <laughs> OK. Um, hello, everyone. This is uh, Dr. Kambiz Ghazinur. I am an associate professor at the Center for Criminal Justice, Intelligence and Cybersecurity. Uh, I am uh, responsible for our cybersecurity program and SUNY online cybersecurity program. I'm also director of the Advanced Information Security and Privacy Lab uh, here at SUNY Canton. Um, what inspired me to do grad studies was um, after I did my bachelor's studies, um, I knew that I really liked teaching and actually doing research. And if you want to do that, you basically uh, want to be involved in academia. Basically, you have to do your master's and doctorate studies. And then after that, I, do, I did two years of postdoctorate studies as well. Pretty much I had nothing to do but just study. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, that's, that's why that's what inspired me. And um, now I'm advising doctorate students, you know, graduate students doing research and I absolutely love it. And thanks for having me on this panel. Thank you, Combees. We appreciate you being here. You're welcome. Garrett, go ahead. Hi, everyone. I am Dr. Wolf, and I am in Applied Psychology. psychology. Used to be the curriculum, curriculum coordinator, but... That's me, sorry. Yeah, we're good? good. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I am Canadian, and I did most of my graduate work in Canada at University of Windsor and University of Ottawa. I think there's a bit of a repeat there. 
No, I can't. I get totally distracted. I can only just focus on like one thing at a time. <laughs> anyway, I'll just keep talking. Uh, the thing that inspired me to go on to graduate school was I didn't want to join real life. And I wasn't sure what I wanted to do other than I knew in psychology you needed to get a graduate degree. So I was like accidental in terms of finding myself in grad school. I didn't know what I wanted. So I just kept. Anyway, nice to see your faces. Thanks for being here. Can you hear me? All right. My name is Patrick McManus. I also teach in the applied psychology program. Um, I have two master's degrees, one in sociology and one in mental health counseling. Uh, my first, I guess the question is, how did I get into it? The first one, um, I got into it kind of because I didn't want to get out of school. I didn't want to grow up, and so I just stayed. I uh, got my bachelor's at the same school that I got my master's in, um, and that was okay. A um, little bit of debt unnecessarily, perhaps, but my second one was I feel the right way. Um, I was ready, interested, knew uh, what I wanted. Uh, I'd already been doing counseling, but without the degree, and so um, I knew what I was getting into and I was really interested in it. So. I can got a glimpse at two different ways of graduate school. And um, the second one actually got me here, which I'm really happy to be here. Um, and so things worked out. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Nick Wildey. I teach in the criminal justice department here at SUNY Canton. Um, so my undergraduate degree was actually in history, which I was not using at all. Um, when I went to work for uh, the Department of Homeland Security. While working there, I realized that there were some interests that I had, especially with regards to research and how transnational criminal organizations operated. So I decided to start working on my master's degree and hope that would take me um, or open up some additional opportunities within DHS for me. Um, what I came to find out is that the master's degree opened up a lot of doors outside of uh, continuing in law enforcement. I started teaching. Um, and ultimately ended up at SUNY Canton, and I'm currently working on my PhD um, in criminal justice. All right. Uh, I'm so glad you guys are all here. If you don't know me, I'm Kelly Peterson. I am an assistant professor in criminal justice. I teach mostly in the criminal investigations major, but also in some of the electives at the higher level, but uh, uh, mostly in forensics. That's my background. What led me to graduate school really was a personal challenge. I honestly didn't think I could do it, so I tried. And, and it was, well, I finished my years. I wonder, no, I could never it, but I tried and I did. And that's what led me. Um, I'm I'm always asking questions, and really, that's why I do forensics. I'm curious. If I have a question, I go about answering it. Um, my one of my favorite questions was an intern of mine had a question. Have you ever heard the rumor that there's drug residue on dollar? But you ever heard that? It, we were in the crime lab, and I said, "All right, pull money out of your wallet. Let's test it." And the interns then kind of went. It. I get it. You have a question. You do research. You answer the question. Spoiler alert, there was no drug residue. Okay, so um, now I want to open it up for students to ask any questions you have. This is kind of your chance to ask questions about graduate school, maybe the application process. Um, I, students might want to know what the difference is between an undergraduate degree and a graduate degree. Um, so if you have questions, I can come around and bring the mic to you. Yes, Jonah. OK. <laughs> yep. 
So Jonah's question was, when he, when they went into graduate school, was it as hard or harder than they expected, or was it a relief thinking, okay, this is where I'm meant to be, essentially. This is what I'm meant to do. And you can decide. Um, <clears throat> for me, I think one of the issues was, <clears throat> during undergrad, the only thing I was focused on was undergrad. Um, working on both my graduate degrees, I was working full time too, so it was a little bit different. In terms of was it harder, I don't think it was harder. I think it was different. Um, so the expectations are very different. Instead of broad exposure to ideas, you're really starting to focus in on more specific topics and more specific ideas. So if you're studying at a graduate level, a program that you uh, genuine, genuinely enjoy, it doesn't seem like it's more work. It's just a different type of work, if that makes sense. Can you hear me okay? There, I think it's maybe fading out a bit. No, okay. So um, yeah, it's a different kind of work for sure because when you're an undergrad, you're really focused on tests. You're really focused on, you know, kind of maybe even regurgitating answers for the professor. And, and that's really not what graduate school was about for me. You would be assigned maybe 10 or 11 articles for a week and you have to read them all and synthesize them. You gotta get really good maybe at skimming and trying to put it all together to see a bigger picture come prepared to discuss when you're in the classroom. And that might not be something that you're all familiar with. Right now, you're kind of more often passive recipients of the information. And again, you know, just like Nick said, it's a, a broad range of topics you might not even be that interested in. But when you're in grad school, it's really like you're honing in on stuff that you're really interested in. And so reading 10 articles a night doesn't really feel like the kind of work that you might expect it to. Um, but it definitely is very different. There's few tests. The ones that there are, there are big ones, but they're, it's not the same kind of pressure that you have on like every for three weeks, there's like a multiple choice test. It's, it, that's not the kind of work that's there. So, yeah. So um, Gaynell's question is, if she wants to apply for a master's degree, is she required to resubmit every transcript in the admissions process? In the SUNY system? Yep. OK. I'm not sure how it works across SUNY. If you were applying outside of SUNY, for sure you have to send all your transcripts, um, and usually official ones too. But um, it, that may be something where it's, it's waived or the campus does it automatically. I'm not sure. That's kind of that's procedure, but you shouldn't let that stop you because usually campuses can get that done within 24 hours for sure. So good question though. The, the transcripts are necessary for all your grad grad applications. Kathleen, you can go ahead if you unmute yourself. Okay, uh, now I, I couldn't hear you, Katie. Can, can you hear me now? Um, so I am attending a SUNY school for my graduate degree, and I, 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 I went to the school for my goes on my side. Um, I'm, att I'm attending a SUNY school for my graduate degree and I went to a SUNY school for my undergraduate as well, but I took some extra coursework at a private school in the process and they required those transcripts as well. So everything in my background was uh, required, both the SUNY background and even just singular courses at another college.
Okay, so I'm going to give you guys a, a little tip. Not all schools are going to require the GRE. So I specifically found schools that didn't require it because I don't want to take it. So that was not one of the steps I needed to do. Um, so most of the programs you, you know, apply similar to your undergrad, you uh, apply for admission to the school and they'll ask for possibly a writing uh, writing sample. Um, now I'm thrown off because I heard myself. Um, so I think I had for my PhD, I believe, you know, I, I applied like normal, um, filled out the actual application. I provided a writing sample, um, and then transcripts, um, for my master's degree. And I believe, I don't think they actually asked for undergrad transcripts. I think it was just for my master's. Um, but yeah, I would maybe seek out schools that don't require a GRE. I did. Cumbies, do you want to speak to the GRE? Okay. Um, sure. Um, as a, uh, same as uh, uh, Professor Wolf, I'm also an undercover Canadian. So basically in Canada, we don't have GRE. Uh, and actually I was shocked to see GRE is required in most of the American uh, universities. When I moved to Ohio and became a professor there, I said, what is GRE? And so, and quite frankly, uh, I've seen many people with high GRE scores that are not really built for grad studies, and I've seen many people with no GRE and they are perfect for graduate studies. So, uh, but sadly, that's policy for most of the schools. Um, I agree with my uh, friend Nick that um, if you can avoid it, avoid it. But if that's a school that you really want to go to, um, GRE is must. Spoiler alert, some, some, some schools, they might waive GRE open requests from a faculty member, but not all schools are like that. So check with their policy. Um, yeah, personally, I don't like it, but it is what it is for some schools. Thank, Thank you. you. So, so I did do the GRE, both the general and the psychology specific one. So if you're asking about the application process, it's an excellent question. It's gonna differ by every kind of program. Um, and so again, if you don't have to do it, some people are saying it's extremely traumatizing, but you remember the SATs probably, they weren't the worst thing in the world. That's what the GREs are like. I didn't study for the ones that I just went and wrote them and said, let's hold on to our butts. Let's hope that this is gonna work out for me. The other one study for like a regular test. Uh, application process can involve a writing you know, sample, but in some cases you may have to reach out ahead of time to join a research lab or to find an advisor. And so what you really need to do is be careful about knowing the steps ahead of time. My recommendation would be pinpoint some places you think you might want to live because some people don't want to live just anywhere. I have to be in Syracuse. So then you go look at the programs there, go specifically to their admission as required. My transcripts, a writing sample, I need an advisor lined up ahead of time. You may need to start emailing and there's actually a really wonderful to you know, write a letter to a, superv a potential supervisor. It can be stressful and expensive. I had to drive like 11 hours to Windsor from where I was. Psychology. Sorry, I believe the opposite. So I would say just really careful knowing what the steps are. And if you're not sure, make a checklist and double check with somebody like one of us would be happy to like go through your list with you and make sure I took care of all of that and I have my ducks in a row because some of some of them are doing it to make sure you're really serious about the process. So like I can eliminate you if you don't want to take all the steps necessary to do it. Um, other places, you know, they'll, they'll want grad students, so they won't put you through the trauma of the GREs, but I really don't think you were that bad. I will say the opposite of my colleagues. I don't think you were that bad personally, but that's just, that was my perspective. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. And I'll go ahead and add on to that. I didn't take the SAT or any of the bachelor entrance exams, um, but I did take the GRE and 
Um, I'm, you know, of course I went all the way through my doctorate. I love school and I work at one and I loved it. So it wasn't as horrible to you know, study and sit for the test and everything. But, you know, it does come at a cost for time, and actual money. So if you don't need to take it, there's no shame in, in not taking it. Uh, you know, and also I think I can speak for all of us involved. Um, talk with your advisor, uh, trusted professor that you know either works in the field or knows people in the field that you want to go into. We're literally here to help you. So if you have questions, we can tell you about programs either we've been through or we know of, and then, you know, ask us questions. We'll be, you know, happy to write recommendation letters or just walk you through the process. We're here to help you and really, you know, don't feel like you can't ask us questions. You know, there's really no dumb question unless you don't ask it. And don't feel like you're pounding us. I had a, a mentor in college who did not ever send in my recommendation letters, so I didn't get into grad school that I could have gotten into. And she just forgot. I mean, she did there, you know, we all have lives, things to happen. But, you know, come to us, ask us, hey, the timeline's coming up, remind us. So. Feel, you know, we're here to help, literally, you guys. So, Patrick, did you want to jump in? Yeah. Um, for both of my graduate school applications, um, I found the like short answer essay questions really a nice way for me to put myself out there and let them get to know me with some kind of um, frank honesty, like. Um, I'm not a perfect person in my grades in my undergrad weren't great, but I had a good reason for that. And so I was a question to kind of line that up. And so boom, home run, I knocked that one out of the park. Same thing with my um, um, counseling degree. Um, as long as you have a narrative as to who you are, where you've been, and how that has turned you into who you are now, then that's what they want here. And I think if you can put that in application, I'll Go ahead, Jonah. Okay, I know like when applying for college and different like military fields, a big intimidation factor when I think you're like taking that bad grade, it's gonna negatively affect me. If I got a good one, it's gonna help me out a lot. If I don't take it, I mean it doesn't really matter. So with the GRE, is it similar like that? Like get a bad grade on it, like, will that negatively affect you? Or like, is it like that? Like, you like, try to not take it? I'm worried about that. So, so Jonah's question, question is, um, he's worried if you do poorly on the GRE, is that going to look bad on your whole application or your, your ability to be admitted and then not take it? I think it kind of depends on the school. I'll let your folks field that. Um, so I can speak to the fact that the worst part of my psychology GRE was in the program that I wanted go into which was social psychology so you can still fail and still be fine i mean it's a, a holistic look that they're taking so it's the gres and sometimes two kinds and then there's your essay and there's your interview and there's the way you answer questions and there's everything else that you might bring to the table too so i really wouldn't be that stressed about it in some fields clinical psychology for example it might be a make or break but that's very rare and it's going away because people are realizing problems with standardized testing as a means of, I mean, companies said this, some, some people, people do really well on standardized tests and then they were, are not that suited for the kind of independent learning that you're doing in grad school. So I, it won't make or break you. And you can, if you know ahead of time, do it more than once. And that's why the GREs are offered like spring, winter, and the summer, and some people will do it multiple times just the way you do your SATs. Um, and I know if you're living around here, Ottawa has GREs that you can go and do. That's where I did mine. So. Clarkson does now too, actually. Awesome. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I'll speak to that. I wouldn't let it stop you from from taking them. Obviously, the colleges are going to look at more than just your GRE score. So take it, especially if the school you want to go to requires it. Don't let it scare you off from a school just because you have to take the GRE. You can take them multiple times. Um, sometimes you just don't know what to expect the first time. 
And so you may just sit a second time with fewer nerves, knowing what you're, you know, going to go through. But yeah, don't ever let it see you off. Kambiz or Kathleen, do you want to add anything to that? Or kind of. Kambiz said in the comments, oops, sorry. Kambiz said in the comments, you really expected to be an independent learner in grad school, and that's really a key thing. So keep that in mind. Self directed. Yep, and Kathleen dittos what you guys are saying. <laughs> yeah, saying for you guys, uh, yep. at least this last year or so, grad school learning and now we're with the online learning, you're getting kind of a jump start mm -hmm. because we're more online more self-guided more self-motivated with online learning so we're all getting that kind of self-motivation self-guided self-learning so you guys all have a leg up hi more questions you guys aren't always quiet all the time. I know something they might be thinking about. How do you pay for graduate school? Where do you get the money to do this? Uh, so I lucked out. Most of my master's was paid by the military. Um, so I had the GI Bill available. I was still in the reserve, so I had tuition assistance uh, funding available as well. So that covered a pretty big portion of it. Um, but I was also working full time. Um, and when I started working on my master's, I actually had my undergrad loans paid off and I was pretty bound and determined not to go back into debt. Um, so I would pay out of pocket for anything that wasn't covered by tuition assistance or um, the GI Bill. Um, PhD for me is pretty similar. I refuse to go back into debt. Um, look to your employer to see what sort of options they have because most employers do offer um, some funding and some funding is better than no funding. Um, you'll find, or at least my experience, you'll find fewer scholarship options for grad school. Although depending on your field of study, you might be able to get um, a grant or become a TA. It really depends a lot on the school you go to and your field of study, but uh, there is funding out there. Um, you have to look for it. It's, it's definitely a little bit different than undergrad, um, but, but there is funding out there. Patrick, what? Yeah. Um, coming to that, ask my wife. Uh, she also is a PhD, and um, her advice was to you have to balance that with knowledge and, and kind of insurance of what you're going to make afterwards, right? So perhaps you could, if you do have to go into debt, you better damn well make sure that you're going to be able to get a job that makes enough money to pay it off. Because the last thing you want is a lot of debt and not a lot of job prospects, because then um, you're going to be hurting. One thing to remember too is, is that, that when you join a PhD program, you're um, like kind of cheap labor to a university. So they will give you what's called a graduate assistantship, where you might be grading undergraduate papers or you might be doing other things. And in fact, every institution that I attend in, that's a different one for my master's, for my PhD, and my postdoctoral fellowship. The programs had it lined up where some of the money is paid for by giving you what's called a graduate assistantship. So it's probably, it, it can range. Uh, some of it almost covers tuition, some of it is not quite enough. I had to work retail, I had to scrounge, I had to like do other research positions and apply for everything that was there. Um, I did go into massive debt, which I'm still paying off. So I might be the one that's like out of order on this one, but. Um, I knew that's what I had to do. And so remember that the universities know that it's expensive to go to grad school too. And there are things that are built in for you to be able to help pay called again, a graduate assistantship. And that's that language you should be looking for on a website when you're thinking about which grad school to join. I'm just going to jump in for Kathleen really quick. Um, um, so Kathleen, can you guys hear me okay? okay? Kathleen says, like Professor Wildey, hers is also paid by the military. Her husband, she gets spouse benefits because her husband's enlisted. Um, she said she didn't really, don't willingly pay for anything until you search every nook and cranny for graduate assistantships, is what she's saying. Um, and she had multiple that she could have applied to, uh, but she didn't make those tuition assistance. And she's actually working with our office in the internship at St. Lawrence right now while she's doing her grad degree. So she's getting work experience and doing those things at the same time, which is smart. 
it worked. Can you guys hear me? Oh, there I am. There's a delay. The phone on. Um, I worked all the way through. Well, starting in high school, I worked, and I worked all the way through college. Doc. Um, and in criminal justice, there's not always as many um, graduate assistantships. It's a lot of working adults in in graduate school for criminal justice, so there's fewer of them, but they are out there. Um, always ask. Um, you know, there are different options for different schools. So if you're looking at multiple schools, always take into account the cost and what they're going to offer. So uh, shop around, shop around everything because you never know where something's going to pop up for assistance and every penny is really going to count. So my first question was, uh, well, the first is, so is there, like, I know the rule of thumb with uh, financial aid is like state and federal aid kind of caps out at like four years, like two year bachelor's degree, and then it's like, I'm not really sure if you went up to your master's, did you get any of that? Like state and federal aid, or is it just purely um, anything from like your work or the school you're going to, like aid related? And uh, the second thing is, sorry, not cool. You said something to look for on the page. You graduate what? Like assistantships. 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 Yeah. Uh, no, you're okay. <laughs> so, so Jonah's question is about how seed aid um, would would be. How could you get that in grad school? So, does anyone want to speak to that? a lot of FAFSA every year hoping that I'll magically get money and it's never happened but I am offered um, unsubsidized loans every semester so there is there, there are loans available um, early back loans um, so that's an option but I refuse to do that and I'm going to fill out the FAFSA again this year and hope money magically appears and it probably won't and that's okay <laughs> the problem was not being able to get the, the money it was getting too much um, and they just kept giving me loans and I thought I was going to be rich when I was older and so I kept taking them. Um, financial aid time would come and I'd, for a week I'd take my buddies out to the bars. It was ridiculous. So that's a trap you don't want to fall for, right? Like only take what you need. And those gratitudeships that and other opportunities out there, those go to people who bust their hump to find them. It's the students who are go-getters and who are super interested and motivated. Those are the ones that professors see and say, hey, I want to work with this kid. Um, and so, yes, let's, let's get them uh, some um, some help. So if nobody's going to hand you anything, um, you have to really work for it. Okay. Oh, I think Cumbies has something to add. Yep. Can you hear me? Sorry. Okay. Cumbies, go ahead. You you can hear me because I'm not sure if you can. Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, you do? OK, perfect. Um, so my uh, I, I'm pretty much. <laughs> yeah, I was the same weird situation that I actually saved money by going to school because everything was paid uh, through, as uh, Barrett mentioned, through teaching assistantship or research assistantship scholarships uh yeah th maybe that's why i stayed at school and then they just basically not only i didn't pay a penny but also i saved a lot of money so but that was canada um <laughs> the the idea is make sure when you reach out to a professor uh, ask about funding opportunities so um normally they have grants um, they have some budgets from uh, particular either federal or private grants. Um, also ask them that if there is any uh, summer internship, they might not have uh, enough money to cover your tuition fee, but also but they might have uh, some money for, you know, so they can partially cover your tuition fee. Um, it's perfectly fine to in your very first email when you uh, email a professor about uh, if there is an opening there in their lab, you know, to ask, um, the, you know, the very last paragraph, 
by the way, I was wondering if there is any funding opportunity available. So it's it's not disrespectful at all. Um, I know many people from different cultures actually think this is extremely disrespectful. It's not. It's perfectly fine to ask these questions from a professor. Um, and I get pretty much four or five emails a week that students want to work with me. Uh, one thing that please don't do, <laughs> please don't copy and paste the same email to every single professor in that department. Uh, sometimes I've been called Professor Thompson. They even forgot to replace the last name. Uh, we can easily tell when the font size is not the same. So if you have the same one, copy and paste. Don't do that. This is a big turn off. This is a big no no. Um, I'm pretty sure my colleagues can also comment on that, but uh, uh, you spend time, write one paragraph. As Barrett mentioned, reach out to them. Um, just be be yourself. Uh, and you know what? We get a lot of these emails, so um, m make sure that you write that email in a way that it stands out and, and we kind of like attract their attention. Don't just throw a paragraph that, hey, that's the <laughs> and again, be respectful to these uh, professors. Um, um, just be to the point, introduce yourself, say why you're interested. Um, most of these professors on their web page, they actually have instructions for you. OK, I remember I used to have instructions on my web page that says if you want me to be your potential advisor, the subject of your email should be should start with request for advisor uh, or whatever and then attach these documents because if you don't do that they know that you haven't even read their web page you haven't even you know looked at their web page um, this is a big red flag um, if you want to work with me but you haven't looked at my web page that's a big no-no right so pay attention to these things and then they would be great um, i'm pretty sure um, if you pay attention to these details you you will be very successful Well, I'm here. Sorry. What kind of grad programs are you thinking about going into? Because we're talking about research based ones for the most part, and there's a real difference between applied programs like nursing, where you may not have to do like a research project with a supervisor, and then, a, you know, like a psychology graduate degree. So, could people just sort of say what kind of grad schools are thinking about going to programs? I just love to hear what you so that we can tailor the response. Yeah. MBA. 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 OK, so okay. there's an example. MBA would be a more of applied one where you may have to find someone, but it, you may not have to reach out to a supervisor ahead of time. So some of the things may not apply to the other ones. So who else has some of their medical school? OK, so some of this does apply to you. I'm yeah. Psychology. Psychology. Yes, yeah, yeah, so, so everything that I'm saying, you have to do exactly as I say. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, Reaching out to a supervisor ahead of time will be relevant for you, but for nursing, I'm not sure that that's the case. For MBA, you have to check on the website. So please don't don't think that every piece of advice right. that we're giving applies to every program. There's a real difference between research-based programs and applied programs that are to move up into a, a better position in the field they already. Does that make sense? Yep. And can I just add the packet that you have kind of differentiates between some of those degree programs and like professional associations and things like that, um, so that. It's not all kind of a one size fits all approach like Barrett was just saying. Yeah, absolutely. When you say psychology, even that could be a bunch of different things, right? Like, what do you want to do with that? Are we talking PhD? Are we talking master's? Are we talking um, PsyD? Are we talking um, social or counseling? You know, it could go a lot of different ways. So all of you, no matter what it is that you think about, you really should put in the research so you're not stuck going to the wrong school, getting the wrong degree, and afterwards kicking yourself saying, oh, shoot, I really wanted to do this. Um, so look into it beforehand. Talk with, like has been said, we're here to help you for sure. Yep, Mohammed. I had a comment. Uh, so I have been looking into the grad school, and uh, I think it's good and so I have really gone through so many schools. Anybody who is trying to look for the grad school, they have to make sure they're not looking for anything like, as she said, applied or anything that is educational. 
if, since they are sitting here for like the research programs mostly. So if you're going for any particular major that has a research program and they also need to like, as they have said, like you need an assistance, you know, the assistance program that your professor can give you or help you for the funding that also like you join to the research program to the grad school. So that also gives you funding towards your uh, school. So this is what I came across from my brother that goes to Clarkson. He's in the research research team and he works for his professor and he's also in the research program too. So that helps them out. So you're saying he's a research assistant for his professor, yeah. right? So you can get paid to help the professor or faculty can do some research. Yeah. Well, one, one thing I would challenge you on, I think, is um, to say that all research side don't think that no you did not have to reach out to the supervisor to get into master's in mental health counseling um, no nope. did you guys either whereas Humvees, i assume is has more similar to experience yep. me where you find your supervisor ahead of time before you got into that program so actually i think it might be the rare um experience that this sort of research side is the thing because for a lot of people it's more of those skills like i worked in the field i was an expert there for like 13 years or something I'm, i was reading everyone's bio um and so they worked and then came to a teaching and late, right? Whereas for me, I was kind of always on, on that track um, with my research background. So I actually would, like I said, I would challenge that maybe um, only Cumbies and I might have to have a supervisor at a time. Not sure. My comment was uh, like when they look for a grad school, it was like uh, you have to see if the school is offering research program. Because I have found that like some schools don't offer their research program, I see. then you cannot apply for that I if see. you're looking into something like yeah, that. So the assistantship program. isn't there unless yep. there's a research yep. program. That makes sense. Yeah, ab absolutely. And for me, it was school by school was different. Some of them expected you to find the mentor ahead of time. Some of them didn't. Some of them were really research based and had research programs and assistantships. Some didn't. So it really depended. I looked, I looked at really who I wanted to work with uh, as, as far as researchers went and um, things like that. And so I really went with what I was passionate about. And then sadly, I worried about the money later, which I, if I could do it again, I would do it backwards. But um, I don't know about the rest of you, but I was raised to not talk about money with strangers, right? Some of you guys are, you know, don't bring it up. This is the one case where it's perfectly fine and uh, a lot of mentors will think it's weird if you don't ask about things like assistantships and you know and they will just think you don't need it and they won't offer it if you don't ask about it so uh, ask about it be forward tell them you need it it's the same thing with us we can't help you if you don't tell us you need help right we can't help you in your classes if you don't tell us we can't help you with this process if you don't tell us I'm not going to hunt you guys down later and go, how's your grad school app going? Where'd you apply to? Do you need a reference letter? Right? So just talk, open your mouth, ask questions. Bother us. We like it. So, yeah. Um, oh, so there we go. Hold it closer. Uh, um, one common thing that may link like a research pro, uh, based program, applied program like from Consulting Counseling, is that both for that you do um, and for the uh, other side of um, Really, the most important thing there is kicking back um, for your professors that. Uh, at the research in a research program, they will see that, and you potentially will work with them for the rest of your career, uh, and they will see that you're doing well. And the same thing happens with an internship. Potentially, you go there, and if you just are a person sitting in a chair, not doing anything, trust me, they will see that too, and you're not going to get hired. And you're not going to get a good reference. Um, but if you go in there and you're a go-getter and you self-started. And you say, what can I do? Start your own projects and make that internship yours. They're going to see that. And there may be a spot for you afterwards. So that really is clutch. Um, 
I'll just follow up on that. Internships are so important. Um, and when I did mine, I went somewhere I knew I would work if I got offered a job. And, you know, almost 15 years later, they were saying goodbye to me because I was coming here. So I worked my, you know, my whole career forensics at the place I did my internship. So, um, and I went to grad school all the way through at the same, co you know, the same police department. So, um, with tuition assistance from them, but you know, not a lot, but some, every little penny helps. But I was there, I was not the only intern when I started, but I was the only intern still at their, the police department 15 years later. I know Kathleen can speak to that. Oh, Jonah's got a question. Go ahead. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> It kind of sounds like someone was asking, who do you ask for letters of reference for graduate school? You should be writing letters on your behalf because you're going to need them for your applications. Yep. Someone who knows you well, start off with that. Someone who knows you and can speak to uh, your work. Um, so someone you've had multiple classes with, maybe your advisor. It, each program is going to ask for a certain number of references. And sometimes a certain set, either your academic advisor or somebody you've had so many classes with or what have you. But there are people outside of your program. It hasn't been brought up yet, but you're a member of the honors program. So the director of the honors program will write a letter if you need it, right? Or somebody if you're a minor, your minor, somebody in your minor program could write a reference letter. So the key really is somebody that knows you. I think Kath can Kathleen jump in? Oh, actually, go ahead. Yep, Kathleen, go ahead. Um, so on um, the letters of reference, um, actually one of my personal big mistakes I made as an undergraduate was not bonding with any of my professors really closely. Um, and so I lacked references. Um, so I would recommend now, like all of the panelists have been saying, make connections with your professors, use them to ask for help, and also just creating those bonds is going to give you a letter of reference later on if you show your initiative and you make your presence known in class. Um, those are the kinds of people that can corroborate for your professionalism or your academic dedication, qualities like those. So from somebody who made the mistake, I'm giving the advice to try to make those connections now. Um, and jumping backwards a question just really quickly, my personal internship experience is unfortunately unpaid, um, but also very unique in that you can find people to be very flexible to get the kind of experience that you want. For example, I'm doing everything remotely. Um, so there is flexibility in these kinds of situations, especially when you're a working professional, but that. Yep, thanks Kathleen. Okay, how many people here are scared to ask faculty for things? Or like, oh God, I don't ask with a letter. Oh my God. Please don't be scared. This is our job. Our job is to move you on to the next stage of your life. And so writing reference letters is part of the joy that we have of trying to help you do that. It's scary to ask faculty for things. And the more communications that have to go back and forth before they can get you something, the worse it is. So my recommendation is you give people uh, your resume, your grades, the like, you know, the ad that you're applying to, whatever it is, as much information as possible right up front. I am much more likely to respond to that quickly and get it done right then instead of saying, like, yes, of course, I'd be happy to write you a letter. Thank you so much, Dr. Wolf. Can I have the information? Yes, you can. Where is it? Here it is. You know, it's the more communications that have to go, that makes it a lot more difficult for us. So yeah, it's part of our job. You should not feel afraid to ask. If you think that you have a relationship with that person, then you should definitely reach out to Mosquito or all yes. follow here. Um, and, and put the information in email. That's crucial, I think, to getting a good letter and getting it done quickly. Nick, did you want to jump in too? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, just uh, touch on what Dr. Wolf said. Um, 
build those relationships with your professors early on. Don't be afraid. 95% of the faculty members here genuinely like being here. They like teaching. They like watching you learn. They're watching you grow. And it's a genuine passion for most of us. Um, I think that's one area that I failed in undergrad. I was kind of, I put all my professors up on this pedestal. Um, and then come to find out, look, I'm a professor. And I don't think all my professors were all that smart now. Um, <laughs> So, so build a relationship now because it's going to be helpful in the future. Two, if you do some of the other reference, let them know. I had that guy in my office six months ago for a student uh, who I don't know. And uh, the guy in my yeah, he had the last three years. And I looked up, yep, it was an online class. Don't remember the student. And just wanted to use me for a reference to get a job. So as you can that doesn't go very well or want me or the FBI just to drug your case. Um, so, don't just that line to somebody with a reference to or reference request. Cumbies wants to jump in if that's OK. OK, hold on. Get my mic set up here. Oh. OK, can you hear me now? Can you hear? Can you guys hear him? Can you say something? Uh, can you hear me now? <laughs> yep. Can you hear yeah. him? OK. <laughs> no, you don't miss anything if you don't hear me. Well, that's OK. So, um, uh, in, in the past 12 years, I've never received a reference letter that says uh, this is student is horrible. Don't work with him so okay. or her. So so, um, you know, this is one thing we get so many boring recommendation letters or reference letters that it just says, yeah, the student's good. But the ones that we really like is when we see that you've done something impressive, that uh, it really excites that faculty member and they go above and beyond. Um, I've received uh, reference letters that are four or five pages and they, they, they're just so impressed with your work. So my advice would be um, don't get a recommendation from a prof that you've worked with and you've just got an A or that's that's not something we're looking for. Just if you've if, if you've done something really impressive, um, then I, I would say that's more valuable than giving us uh, four or five reference letters that they all say, yeah, Johnny was a good boy and you know, got always A and came to class on time. That doesn't really tell us much. Thank you. Thank you. I was just gonna say, uh, it just so what everybody else has said, we really as professors, at least the four of us anyway, um, and I know companies as well really want to see you guys do well. Um, my background, my bachelor's is in anthropology. We, at, at least at our school, uh, there are who taught who going back. So you, we see it moving forward. Where are you guys going to go? What are you going to do? How can we cheer you on? And you know, in a few years, we might be saying, oh, she was one of my students. Where's our legacy gonna go? You guys are carrying the torch. And we wanna be able to help you do that. Yeah. Question back there. So the question was, do you have advice for asking for recommendation letters? You've been out of school four years, and so kind of reconnecting with some of those faculty for reference letters. Yep. Yeah, I can speak to, to this a little bit. I had someone email me like a couple months ago, and I hadn't taught them in eight years, and I had no idea who that person was, and they were reaching out to me out of desperation because they had been out for so long, and they liked my class, and they got an A. And so, um, um, you know, there's the question of if to write a letter when I don't really remember the person. So unfortunately, I had to say no in this case. But if it's a person that you know will remember you, giving as many details as you can can also help. Hi, this is, you know, so and so. I really enjoyed your class. If you remember that we did this thing that helped us to connect and, and that's one way to make me remember you um, and, and to not be afraid to because sometimes you really are in need of a letter. And again, that's our job. It's not just that we enjoy doing it, but to me, it's part of what we're supposed to be doing to move you to the next like level. So you should not feel afraid, but definitely try to make those personal connections. And again, all the information that you can. This is my transcript. This is where I've been working since. Allowing us to get to know you 
in that email again. Perhaps a wider net. So the question was, is there a wider net that you should cast? So maybe if you have a few faculty that you think you could reach out to, but again, being more hopefully reaching out to the ones that you really think knew you and knew something personal and great about you. I would add, I would too, is, is try to throw your face in there somehow, either in person or with a picture, because I'm horrible with names, but I'll remember your face. And so that might be an option to help you out. Any other questions? Yeah. I don't think so. No, we've got a nine attendees in there. <laughs> Can I give a failure story? Sure. I just, I just asked if I could give the a story, story of failure because I, I went into my master's degree thinking that I wanted to be a sports psychologist. I was going to work with Olympians and I was going to do all this crazy stuff. And so I had spent my whole undergraduate career thinking this is the thing I want to do. I got into this awesome master's degree and then I got there and I hated that work. Like I was an athlete my whole career and then I, I really, really disliked it. And I thought, oh my God, I'm despairing at the fact that I'm spending all this money out of pocket. And you know, I the debt that I carry is from my master's degree, honestly. Um, so I, I enjoyed being a graduate student. I didn't enjoy the practitioner side of being a sports psychologist. And so I had to pivot. And I just want you to remember that you can pivot too. And if you get somewhere and it's not the right thing, you did not, don't despair because you didn't lose anything by being that you're in grad school. Your credits can carry over. Mine certainly carried over into my PhD program. I learned what I liked and didn't like. I had things I learned in my master's that really helped me, give me a leg up in my PhD program where I was more competitive for assistantships because of that experience. So I just wanted to say like, don't put the pressure on yourself to be perfect right away. I know for in some cases people worked a little bit and then they really knew what they wanted to do, but I just was like, kept going. Like I'm done my undergrad, I like school and I'm not good at anything else. And I don't want to join real life. So let's do this master's degree. Let's go on, let's keep going. So just to um, forgive yourself, to take some pressure off and to remember that education is never lost. Even if you do a year and you didn't finish, I think it's still a value and you can still transfer those credits to something else eventually. And, it's also important to know that your faculty fail all the time too, and certainly I have a million times over. So don't think that you're gonna have to you know, be perfect in it. It's not a perfect process. Yeah, I wanna to add to that too. When you're reaching out to ask for mentors, or if you need someone to be your advisor before you get started, don't take a rejection as personal. I had one program I really wanted to go to. It was a mentor's friend in Arizona and I was so excited. I had it in my head. I'm going to study at ASU. I'm going to get this degree and this woman disliked me. I have no idea why. She didn't want to have anything to do with me and I took it personally. And I would now look at people. Well, I probably wouldn't have wanted to work with her either. She wasn't very nice, right? So don't take that, you know, I think we all first take things personally like that when somebody rejects us. But really, you got to think about, you know, if what's best for you. And if they don't want to accept you, then that probably isn't the best for you. Do you want to jump in, Patrick? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I agree because if I look back on the things that I did wrong and the mistakes that I made, uh, I could say, look at it on this. Could have done this, could have done this different. There are some things, but like Brad said, it all led to something else. Um, and it all ended up building on the next thing. And as you do research, look into it and, and apply to different schools and and wait until you don't do anything. But eventually you've got to take a risk and go for it. And if you do the legwork, do the research, know that, hey, worst case scenario, um, you change your mind. Uh, like you said, you pivot and build on. Uh, you don't know what you were, who you're we going to be five years from now. We change, and you may change your mind. But as long as you're moving in the right direction, you'll figure it out and get there. Um, come, come. Bees has, has a question, question he wants to pose. What, what are the hidden benefits of going to graduate school? 
you, you want to speak, speak to, to that, that first, one? please? Yeah. Um, the obvious on. one is, of Hold course, on. um, oops, can you, can you hear me? OK, so uh, I remember I asked uh, one of my friends why you did your doctorate, and uh, he said, I just wanted people to call me doctor. Um, so beside those benefits, <laughs> I want to know if your audience, either online or there, if they know other benefits of going to grad school. Of course, you get mostly you get higher paychecks, you get promoted, you know, but do you know, um, can you think of other hidden benefits for some grad studies, by the way, not all of them. So you want to pose this to the students? Yeah, and then I can give them one or two examples of hidden benefits. Anybody can think of hidden benefits of going to grad school? Joda. Being a more desirable applicant for a job. Yep. Anybody else? A life course. <laughs> Did anyone hear what I just said? I said avoid charting a life course. I just kept going to school. Why not? Just put it off for another couple of years. I was 23 years old. I didn't want to go do something for the rest of my life. Keep going to school. There's nothing wrong with that. It gave me an automatic out if I didn't want to do something. I have homework. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't do that. I can't help you move. I have homework. <laughs> right? And I had a family, and so. There was a lot of times I didn't want to do family stuff, right? Oh, I'm sorry, I can't take the kids to the zoo with you this weekend. I got I got homework, right? And now the four of us, the four of us can tell you, we still have homework. <laughs> you guys have five classes, maybe six classes. We have six classes, but there's thirty of you in each one. Anything else, um, Kathleen? Do you want to add anything? So this, hold on, I, hold on. okay, hold on. Because Kathleen's going through right now. <laughs> um, this is super ulterior motive, but especially in the day of age of online shopping and well, COVID, obviously like COVID's put a little restriction on us, but student discounts people this can save you a lot of money admissions to things there's a whole website unidays if you guys are on it now go get on that but then you get into grad school and you extend those discounts by two three four years and so call that a silly one but um whether you're a student and you need to replace your computer or you're looking to get your microsoft suite technologies all of those things become suddenly much more available to you And I want to add one more thing if I think no one mentioned about that. Um, and that's about traveling. I've been to Europe five times. Completely all the costs are covered. I've been to West Coast four or five times for different conferences. So if you're in, that's why I said it's not for every single grad school, but if you're involved in research, then once your publication is accepted, you get the chance to go and present your work. So um, that's a really, really good motivation that hopefully your faculty member um, either sends you or is kind enough to ask you to join him or her there. I had um, one of my students actually last year, he was 15 when he joined my lab. Uh, he was high school student and uh, by, by the age of 17, he co-authored two papers with me and last year, uh, we went together to London, all his, uh, well, not all, but most of his uh, costs were covered. And at the age of 17, he presented in a, in a research conference. And I don't know what I was doing. I was playing with Lego most probably when I was 17. Uh, but um, that's what I'm saying. Like it's, it's, um, it's an amazing alternative motive to just basically travel. Hopefully that's another motivation for you guys to do uh, grad studies. Definitely, yeah. Absolutely, I agree with Humbees. I had a mentor who went to grad school in Switzerland. He was flying back to Switzerland for his grad studies while working full time. I wouldn't mind going to Switzerland. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> it's 
some of the perks. I know the mosquitoes are getting kind of bad out here, and uh, I don't. If you have any last minute burning questions, um, otherwise we don't want you to get eaten alive. Um, but I'm sure these folks would be happy to let you reach out to them via email or, you know, in career services. I just wanted to put a plug. I know that um, Donnie has borrowed. We have grad school admissions prep books. We have GRE prep guides that are all free to you as students. And some of the free resources are in this packet. So GRE prep. Um, if you have questions about um, fee waivers for admissions, that kind of stuff, we can also help with that. So, and I'm happy to help connect you with other folks, and I'm sure they are as well. Um, so, thank you so much for coming out. We had 10 online participants, nine now, and a little over 20 people, and that's what we were hoping for. So, give yourselves a hand. Thanks for coming out tonight. Thank you. That's right. <laughs> And thanks Kathleen and Cumbies for being so patient with the online portion and to RJ and Ed and our technical folks who made it happen because it was definitely a technical feat. So thank you. <laughs> yes, did you get two at once? Get them. Thank you everyone. Bye, -bye. thank you, bye. Um, so if you want to take any food with you folks, um, there's still plenty of food left. Yep. Did everybody sign in? I think you.